So we're going to do a quick overview of the Safe and Sound campaign, and then we'll be reviewing the three core elements of effective safety and health programs, management leadership, worker participation, and a systematic approach to find and fix hazards. We'll close out with actions that you can take today to get started, and then follow up with some Q&A for all of the presenters. A little bit of housekeeping notes before we get into the presentations. Everybody on the phone is going to be muted throughout the presentations. At the end of the presentations, the panelists will take questions. You can submit your questions through the, throughout the presentation using the Q&A box. You'll find that on the bottom right-hand screen, uh, side corner of your WebEx screen. You can also ask a question over the phone, and our operator will be giving instructions on how to ask those questions at the end of the call. A recording of this event, along with the slides, will be available soon on the Safe and Sound campaign website, which you can find at www.osha.gov slash safe and sound. And now, let me start with a quick intro to the concept of the safety curve. The safety curve is about employers' commitment to safety and health. And if you look at the curve, you'll see that it spans the spectrum from a little bit of commitment to safety and health or no commitment on the left end of the spectrum, all the way to those with a great deal of commitment to safety and health. As OSHA, we target the different regions of the curve with different types of programs. If you're on the left-hand side of the curve, that's where we have targeted inspections, we have um, our severe violator enforcement program, and for um, employers with really significant challenges, we've got criminal, inspection, uh, criminal penalties. On the right-hand side of the curve, where we're trying to get most employers, you'll find most folks are in our compliance assistance and consultation region. These are folks who we don't actually see in person very often, um, or not at all. These are folks that are interacting through guidance documents, through our website, at conferences and meetings. They're trying to do the right thing. As you move over to the right side of the curve, you'll see um, our recognition program. These are people who are in our voluntary protection program or our safety and health recognition program and who have demonstrated a great commitment to safety and health. We think one of the things that moves employers from the left side of the curve to the right side is a safety and health program where they are proactively um, managing safety in a positive way, not waiting for injuries and illnesses. This campaign is about moving employers to the right on the safety and health curve. One of the really great things is employers are the ones who choose where they are on the safety and health curve and what type of commitment they're going to have to safety and health. And so it's really easy for people to pick themselves up and move to the right-hand side of the curve. Um, we started the Safe and Sound campaign in partnership with a number of co-organizers. So we have tried to get the whole safety and health profession to wrap their arms around the concept of promoting safety and health programs. You'll see our co-sponsors at the bottom of the screen, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, the Voluntary Protection Program Participants Association, the American Society of Safety Engineers, the National Safety Council, the Center to Protect Workers' Rights, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. All of us have gotten together around this concept that every business, every workplace needs a safety and health program with three core elements, management, leadership, worker participation, and a systematic approach to find and fix hazards. There are lots of different pathways to get to a good safety and health program. OSHA recently released our recommended practices for safety and health programs. These updated our 1989 guidelines. The National Safety Council has their journey to safety excellence. The American National Standards Institute has the Z10 standard. ISO just released the 45001 standard. And then many of our state plans have their own standards. All of these approaches to safety and health programs are wonderful. They all share the same three core elements. And they slice and dice things different ways, but there's lots of different pathways to success. What we want are to get employers to take a step in the right direction. As you look at the three core elements, management leadership is about demonstrating commitment to safety and health from the very top levels of your organization. Worker participation 
is about getting meaningful engagement from your workers as you establish your program, as you implement your program, and then as you evaluate your program over the course of the year. And systematic approaches to finding and fixing hazards are about not waiting until somebody's gotten hurt to do things. It's about proactively and positively looking for hazards, about going above and beyond the bare minimums that are in OSHA standards to try and make sure that your workplace is a safe and helpful one. Now, today we have three great speakers who are going to talk about each of the three core elements. Mike Belcher is going to be covering management leadership, John Spath is going to be covering worker participation, and Sam Gallardo is going to be covering finding and fixing hazards. All three of these gentlemen have decades of experience, and any one of them could have covered each of these topics, and they very often do talk about all of the systems together, but we're trying to present you with a variety of experience um, and perspective. And without further ado, I am now going to turn it over to Mike Belcher, who's going to begin our talk on management leadership. All right. Okay, Mike? Thank you very right. much. And uh, good, good afternoon, everyone, or, or good morning, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited about this opportunity to talk to you about leadership. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to say that a safety and health systems approach uh, certainly is not going to occur in a vacuum. It has to be driven by leaders, and that's because leaders are the ones responsible for directing and controlling an organization or a business at the highest levels. We can't just talk about safety. And as a leader, I've noticed two ingredients uh, that I think are essential for success over the years. Number one, it's a belief in safety. Uh, and number two, it's active involvement. So by believing in safety, uh, it's important that your head and your heart are into it because if they're not, people are gonna see right through that and you're not gonna have credibility as a leader. Secondly, you do have to be actively involved. Again, it's not enough to talk about safety and you can't just support safety, but you've gotta roll up your sleeves and you've got to be part of the process. If you're willing to do those things, and you're willing to commit to shifting the safety curve, as Andy Levinson just talked about, there's certainly some, some compelling benefits. Um, on the picture uh, in front of you, you see a photo from 2010, and as most people probably recognize, that's the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, that day, a blowout occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, the rig exploded, and it became uh, the largest U.S. environmental disaster ever as it gushed crude oil into the, the Gulf for about three months. It also killed 11 workers and injured 16 others, and uh, that event has since been immortalized in, in a major motion picture. Um, it took the Chemical Safety Board about six years to finally release their investigation report executive summary from that accident. And what they found was this accident wasn't the result of a careless error or an unsafe act or simple negligence, but rather this event happened uh, because of years of deviations that had been occurring on this oil rig. The CSB concluded that at the heart of this tragedy, the problem really had to do with the company's entire safety culture. And that's why I want to kick off the discussion talking about culture. Uh, this wasn't the first major accident that occurred um, that was attributed to culture. I lived in Florida in 1986 when the Challenger space shuttle blew up over the the coast of Florida. And right after it happened, uh, there was a lot of speculation and uh, some, some news came out about what was caused or what had caused that accident. And I think as most people might remember uh, who were around that time or have read about the accident, uh, the cause of that accident was attributed to the O-rings. And this is very common after an accident occurs like that. It's very common to look for technical reasons. Uh, but what happened uh, after that accident was studied, it was determined that that accident was due to the culture as well, as deviations had become normalized over the years with NASA, and investigators concluded that the, the safety culture at NASA was broken. And NASA did a lot of work to, to rectify that and turn things around, but then in 2003, it happened again when the space shuttle Columbia broke apart on re-entry, and investigators found very, very similar threads or contributions to that accident uh, as they did with the Challenger accident. And, and so the bottom line is that culture is really resilient and hard to change, and if it's not steered by leadership, it will 
uh, tend to revert back uh, to where it was. Culture can be defined as these things. Uh, norms, expectations, unwritten rules, attitudes, values, perceptions, uh, beliefs. Usually these kind of aspects are not taught directly, and they may not have anything to do with a, an official policy, but they exist, and they shape the direction of an organization. And uh, <clears throat> as many people have uh, come to realize, uh, and as Dan Peterson, uh, who I consider the father of safety management, used to say, culture is the major determinant in the behavior of an organization and its people. Over the years, I've seen organizations that were nearly identical in terms of worker selection, safety programs, and safety training, but they were getting radically different results. And the bottom line is you can buy safety training, you can buy safety equipment, you can pay good money and hire good people, but what you can't buy is a positive safety culture. But if you're willing to invest in that culture, um, if you're willing to have leaders that are credible, demonstrate that credibility, when the words of the safety policy are lived out on a daily basis, when the financial decisions you make as an organization show that money is being spent for people, as well as to increase profit, when you're willing to invest in worker participation and making sure that trust exists between management and the workers, you are developing a positive culture and you will reap the rewards of that. So with this next slide, I'm going to cover how leaders influence safety culture. And uh, this was adopted from some work that Todd Conklin did, who, who speaks frequently on the subject of human error and, and human performance. And uh, these are the things that really influence culture from an organizational standpoint. Uh, first of all, leaders influence safety culture through their vision of safety. Um, how do they share that vision with the workforce? Is it not having accidents or is it really more than that? Is it about managing to an acceptable level of risk? Uh, what are the leaders paying attention to? What are they measuring? What are they controlling? Is it all about sales and service and production, which are very important in the reasons that we exist as an organization? Uh, or are they also paying attention to safety? Is it, giving, is it safety given just as much as attention as those other critical measurements? Um, reactions to critical incidents or crises. This is a real big one for me. And one of the litmus tests that I've used for organizations to determine whether those reactions are positive or negative is how people discipline their associates or how they use discipline after accidents happen. Are they using it to punish associates uh, for system-induced violations or system-induced errors? Or do they really restrict the use of discipline and only use it in cases where people are doing things for personal gain or when the violation is, is so egregious? Another worker in the same situation uh, would not, certainly would not have done that. Uh, allocation of resources uh, is one way that leaders influence safety culture. So how is time and money being spent in the organization? Uh, do you see it being spent towards safety improvements and safety training, the things that are going to move the needle with safety? Uh, criteria for rewards and punishment. Uh, how are people bonused? How are they incentivized? Um, who gets promoted, who gets demoted. Those are, are, are strong indicators of safety culture and they're the ways that leaders influence safety culture, whether they realize they're doing it or not. Finally, one that I'm gonna to touch on here in just a few minutes, in a few minutes, is the way that leaders coach. As I love to say, uh, the audio has to match the video. So we're gonna talk about a few of these ways that, that leaders influence the safety culture. And we're gonna start by defining safety excellence. I talked about uh, leaders creating a, a vision for safety. And leaders have the opportunity to define safety excellence for their organization. Uh, and I like to, to start out by defining what safety excellence really isn't or what it's not. It's certainly not having a written program. Uh, written programs are, are just a reference point. It's really the actions that count. And I've spent a lot of time over the last 25 years doing assessments and safety audits and so forth. And uh, 
uh, like most people that are in that business or have done those things, you're going to look at the written programs. Uh, and I've seen so many examples of where the written programs look great and everything's perfect. Uh, and it looks like it meets all the OSHA regulations. But when you go out on the floor and you actually watch the workers and, and see what they're doing, it's anything uh, but safe. So it's the actions that count. Experiencing low injury and illness rates. Uh, low injury and illness rates are an indicator that things might be safe, uh, but they're only telling you where you've been, not where you're going. Uh, so you may have a situation where you're not managing to an acceptable level of risk, but you've gotten pretty lucky and you've had low injury and illness rates, or maybe you've gone a year without accidents or so forth. So we talked about the, the Deepwater Horizon incident a few minutes ago. Uh, ironically, the morning of that event, uh, executives from Transocean were on aboard that rig and they were handing out awards because they had gone seven years uh, without a serious accident, meaning an accident that had impacted uh, the rig's ability to uh, perform. So uh, sometimes you just get lucky. So going a year without an accident, uh, is not necessarily safety excellence, uh, nor is doing everything that it requires. I've always looked at the requirements um, as the bare minimum. So compliance is a goal, not necessarily going to produce safety excellence. Ultimately, what we want is for people to feel ownership for safety and to take responsibility for themselves and for others. So what is safety excellence? Well, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, for me, it's when safety is a core value, not a priority, because priorities can change uh, due to outside influences or other demands. Uh, values remain steady. If safety is truly a value, it would just be inconceivable that we would ever allow unsafe work conditions to flourish. In other words, safety has to be non negotiable I'm not going to read every bullet point. Uh, I'll touch on the systems approach because, again, that's what we're here to talk about today is that systems approach. And that's a key, and one of the key elements of taking a systems approach or a safety and health management program approach is this concept of continuous improvement that was popularized, popularized by uh, Edwards, uh, w. Edwards Deming, uh, talked about the PDCA or plan, do, check, act cycle. So a system, specifically a management system, is simply the way in which an organization manages the interrelated parts of their business. And we've talked about, or we're going to talk about, in addition to management leadership, worker participation, and also a methodical way of finding and fixing hazards here in just a few minutes, which are very critical to this system's approach. And then finally, the last point here on the slide is that a culture of safety exists. So we've talked a little bit about that already. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, but I do want to touch on four critical psychological factors uh, that are essential for success. And I'm a big fan of reading business books. And out of the thousands of books and articles on management and leadership that I've read over the years, there's really just a few psychological dynamics that have really stood out to me as success factors. And I think the four on your screen here are very, very critical. The first one's goal power. And that's simply the power of performance by goals, objectives, and standards. Uh, it's a fact that people perform more efficiently when they have goals to shoot for. That's true in work, and it's true in sports, and it's true in your personal life. Um, I was reading recently about the late coach of the NC State basketball team, uh, Jimmy Valvano, and one of the things he did in practice uh, the year he won the national championship was he devoted an entire practice to having his basketball team uh, get up under the rim, uh, put a ladder under the rim, and then stand up and taking turns cutting down the net. And that's all they did for practice. Uh, and the reason he did that was to really crystallize their thinking and make it very clear what their goal was for the season. Uh, so they kind of got a taste of what it was going to be like at the end of the season. And, and again, really crystallized that uh, and mentally prepared them for the season. So that was, a, I thought, a great example of establishing a goal and really making it crystal clear, um, you know, with the team, uh, whether it's at work or, you know, at, for a sports event. Participation is the second factor. Um, people want to be in on the action. They want to be part of the team. They want to participate. So the leader who asks for suggestions and ideas and really listens uh, to what their workers say is going to develop mutual interest. 
they're going to develop mutual respect, and they're going to develop mutual motivation. Uh, so making people part of the solution is very critical. The third, the third critical factor is feedback. So for people to improve, they need feedback that's timely, that's focused, and frequent. Uh, nobody wants to play ball without knowing what the score is. So what are the yardsticks? Uh, how well are they doing? What are the specific steps to improvement? That's very important and critical in safety leadership because when you have confusion, when you have guesswork, when your workers are trying to figure out what the priority is, whether it's uh, is it safety or is it production, uh, you're going to get misdirected efforts. And this is going to lead to lower motivation and it's eventually going to lead to incidents and injuries. And that's not going to be what we want. Um, the last Last one's recognition. Uh, people have a sincere need to be recognized, and uh, you can use the power of positive recognition to affect change. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was up in the Northeast and I was visiting with a route operations manager for my company, and he was struggling because he was trying to get his drivers to do pre-trip inspections. So a lot of them were just going into the, the route trucks every day. They weren't cracking the hood. They weren't checking the oil. They weren't looking for the, make sure the lights were good, or the tires were good, or you know all those things that, that you have to do. Uh, but he noticed one of them was, and he said every day, you know, this guy would go out and very diligently check his truck and making sure everything works while everyone else just hopped in the trucks and, and left for the day. Um, so he made it a point the next morning during a huddle to call this employee out. And he said, a little nervous at doing it at first. And he said, you know, he brought the guy to the front of the room and the guy wasn't really sure what was going to happen. And he said, hey, I just want to congratulate you and thank you for the time you take to check your truck every morning. It's important to make sure that it's, that it's safe before it hits the road and also um, helps prevent breakdowns so that we don't have to worry about not being able to serve our customers. And so he praised the guy in front of all his teammates. And he said, something, something strange happened. He said, the next day, all the other guys started checking their truck too. So he was able to affect change and get other people to do this simply by recognition, recognizing one associate. And the reason they did that is because they saw what was important to the manager uh, became important to them. Uh, he didn't have to call anybody out or discipline them, you know. Uh, so recognition is critical and people do take, uh, do pay attention to who you recognize and it's an important way of establishing a positive safety culture. Another thing not to overlook when establishing a positive safety culture or demonstrating leadership is, is understanding the importance of coaching. Because if we simply talk to our workers, the possibility of a behavior change is about 2%. If we talk and model it, the possibility of a behavior change is about 10%. When you do those things, in addition to practicing the behavior and coaching it, the possibility of the behavior change changes dramatically and becomes 80%. So effective coaching is really leadership in action. It's motivating, communicating, developing, and empowering people for continuous improvement. So remember I spoke earlier about active involvement. Coaching is a fantastic way to do that. If you do it and do it well, it's a great way to display your interest. You're going to get people to think about safety. You're going to improve employee relations, which is so critical today. Um, we see so many studies out there on employee engagement and how high-performing organizations have employees that are engaged and excited about being there. We need to have the same thing with safety because if we don't, our chances of success are going to be severely diminished. Several years ago, Boeing did a huge study of over 3,000 workers, and they were looking for risk factors that predisposed their associates to having back injuries. And what they found was that the most predictive factor as to whether someone was going to have a back injury was not how much they lifted, it wasn't how much work they were doing, but it was job dissatisfaction. So it's not just enough to look at the physical aspect of a job. You know, we have to consider the psychosocial aspects as well. So employee relations and improving employee relations is a big part of safety coaching, and it's a big part of changing the culture. So safety coaching helps you learn about what's happening, and it helps safe work habits become a way of life. Now, on your screen, there's a quote by Harvey McKay, who's a businessman and columnist. He's known for writing uh, several best-selling books. Uh, Swim with the Sharks Without Getting Eaten, I believe, is his most famous book. Um, I've read it several times. 
And uh, Harvey McKay has said this several times. He says, employees don't care about what you know about them. They care about how much you care about them. So it's important that we take a personal interest in our employees and give them a reason to believe that they mean more to us than simply someone's there to conduct a, a transaction to get a paycheck. Okay, so there's no better way, in my opinion, to demonstrate that you care for someone than to make sure that they know that you have their personal well-being in mind and you are deeply concerned about their safety. Because after all, as leaders and managers, we're responsible for people's hopes, their dreams, and their aspirations, or at least knowing that we care about those hopes, dreams, and aspirations. And if we're able to do that and do it well, um, we can get we can develop that trust with our workers and we can get so much more out of them uh, as a team, as a team that's committed to safety and helping our organizations and our employees succeed. Good leadership involves uh, several of these things. Uh, we've talked about caring and how important that is. I'd like to give you one more example of that, and that has to do with a manager that I met several years ago whose name is Max. Now, he lived out in the Bay Area in California, and I always admired Max because he was such a good manager, and he had the best statistics uh, in, in our company, at least in that, that part of the country. Um, in his spare time, he was a youth football coach, and uh, I was giving a talk on, on coaching one time. He pulled me aside uh, after I gave the talk, and he said, he goes, you don't know how much uh, it means to really care about people, you know, as part of the coaching process. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, let me give you an example. He said, you know, and he told me the whole story about him coaching uh, kids. And uh, he said, I've got kids that live in multi-million dollar homes. I've got kids that live in shacks and they don't know where their next meal was coming from. Uh, he said, but the whole key to getting them to practice, whether it's doing wind sprints or, or running up the steps, is they've got to know you care about them. And he said, once they know you care about them, you can get them to do anything in the world. Uh, so here's the guy who gets it. He got it as a football coach. And I've really found that uh, people who coach uh, recreational uh, sports or, or kids leagues uh, are usually effective coaches in the workplace as well. But I thought that was, that was a great example. Uh, but it does have to start with caring. And if you do that uh, as a starting point, it really sets the coaching process up for success. Uh, it's important to observe in an organized and systematic way. Um, you have to analyze the situation and not jump to conclusions. I think the best way to do that is to ask a lot of questions. It takes more time than telling, but it gets people to think. So when you ask the right kind of questions, you help people recognize the injury potential and to eventually do something on their own to improve productivity, safety, um, and so forth. So questions help avoid things like resentment and misunderstandings and embarrassment. Um, collaboration is, is certainly important. Um, we've talked about asking people su for suggestions uh, because a supervisor who does this very well is going to develop mutual interest and motivation. Uh, and lastly, the most important thing is to help people by providing resources and removing barriers. A lot of times I've seen these coaching processes degrade into disciplinary sessions or lecturing someone on, on what they should do because you'll find people not following the rules. And what we really need to understand is why people aren't following the rules. Maybe it's because the personal protective equipment we provided is uncomfortable, or maybe they're not locking out a machine because the disconnect switch is located in an inconvenient spot. So a big part of the coaching process is understanding why people are doing what they're doing, doing it in an unthreatening way, and then helping them get what they need so they can, they can perform their jobs safely or safely, which kind of leads us to uh, the last thing I want to talk about, and that's reacting to failure. I want to mention this because I think this is probably one of the biggest opportunities companies have to really uh, change things and move the needle when it comes to safety. Because when failures occur, a natural reaction is to really focus on what the worker should have done or could have done. And the problem with that is that focusing on what somebody should have done or could have done doesn't tell us why it happened or how it happened. Uh, it's based on hindsight bias and linear 
thinking. Um, there's something uh, that Conklin, Todd Conklin talks about, Sidney Decker does as well, is this concept about work as imagined versus work as done. So we imagine that work is always going to go according to plan and that people will follow rules and procedures. The reality is it doesn't always work that way. And the reason that we're successful many times as an organization is because people have found a lot of ways to work around those rules, but it's those same workarounds that have made us successful that also cause failure. So we do have to recognize that and we ultimately need to have a system that's error tolerant. Another natural reaction we have to failure is our tendency to attribute causes to internal or personal factors rather than external or situational factors. That's called the fundamental attribution error. And again, it's a tendency to believe that people's behavior reflects uh, some kind of a uh, unique disposition they have. The problem with that approach is that instead of coming up with the true causes of accidents, if we're reacting to a, an accident, um, we come up with attributions and we tend to say things like the worker was stupid, they were careless, or they were a risk taker. And then we take it a step further and we try to apply solutions to these so-called causes. Um, the reality is that what looks like a people problem is usually a situation problem. So we need to be aware of that common cognitive bias. You know, I, I, I like to say this, as many people do, uh, when you have failure, when you have an accident, when you have a serious injury, there's two things that can occur afterwards. Either you can punish someone or try to hold them accountable, or you can try to learn from it, but you really can't do both. I've never seen an organization do both of those well. I've seen organizations say, okay, you know, we're gonna unfortunately have to hold the worker accountable this time, but then, you know, we'll use this as a learning opportunity. It never happens. You know, the new view in safety, which I'm trying to get to that slide right now, the new view is to consider how workers decisions and actions made sense to them, given the circumstances that surrounded them. So when failure occurs, one of the best things a leader can do is to put himself in the other person's shoes. By thinking about what you might do in the same situation, you might come up with some situational factors for a behavior that could shed more light on the subject. And oftentimes you'll find that factors like time pressure, peer pressure, fatigue, workload, tax uh, task complexity, suitability of tools and equipment, all these things play a role in shaping workers' behaviors. It's not simply just somebody uh, doing something unsafe out of spite or for personal gain. You know, the bottom line is that people will never perform better than what the organization allows. If a system relies on people doing the right thing every time, it's going to fail. So. We have to understand as leaders or the leaders we work with that organizational influences, uh, including resource management, um, how we create a vision for safety, how we spend time and money on safety, all those things create a culture. And, and that's what we have to focus on changing. If we focus on the people, it's not gonna work. We gotta focus on the values and we have to focus on the processes. And when it comes to talking about the process, I thought I'd leave you with a little college football anecdote since uh, I am in the South. And uh, even though I'm not a University of Alabama fan, I do admire Nick Saban for what he's done. That's a picture of Nick Saban a couple of years ago when he won uh, his fifth national championship. Um, earlier this year, he won his sixth national championship uh, with an overtime victory over University of Georgia. Nick Saban's success as a coach is often attributed to this coaching method that, that's known affectionately as the process. And that's the things you have to do day in and day out to succeed. The activities and the efforts that have practiced and repeated will lead to success. So this is very important to Nick Saban and he's very good at making sure his players, when they're playing a game, aren't focused on the scoreboard. He doesn't want them to get too comfortable because they're ahead. He doesn't want them to worry that they might lose the game because they're behind. Uh, he wants them concentrating on the play at hand, which I understand every college football play is averages about seven seconds if memory serves correct. So if you're a lineman, you dominate your opponent, you knock them off the ball. If you're a receiver, you concentrate on running the correct route. And so for safety, I think the analogy is this. What are the activities and the efforts that have practiced and repeated 
uh, continuously will yield success. Well, we've touched on a few of those already, and we're going to touch on a few more of these as we continue this webinar, and I turn over the microphone uh, to my colleagues. So, I'd like to thank you for this uh, few minutes, and I think we'll also open it up uh, when everybody's done talking in case anybody has any questions. So, uh, thank you very much. Mike, thank you so much. Um, we're now, that, it, that was a great overview of management leadership, gives us a really good foundation. We're now going to move into the second part of the presentation that John Spath is going to cover, and that is on worker participation and how do you really get workers engaged in running your safety and health program. We're in the process, and I think, um, John, you should have the ball. There you go. Thank you. And, John, if you're on, you might be muted. I was still muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mike. My name is John Spath, and I'm a safety, health, and environmental professional with over 45 years of experience managing uh, for multi-plant manufacturers. I've been a senior national and global account management for the two largest insurance brokers in the world, and I have over 15 years of managing my own consulting practice with up to 19 employees. Now I'm kind of semi-retired and only taking engagements that are challenging and fun like this one. I've written and presented on this subject of employee participation in safety, health, and environment for the past 20 years. And let's see if I can make this stuff work. Uh, during research, one of the first articles I ran across was a 1937 article from Nations Business, which suggested it was a good idea to talk to employees about matters that affected their safety and well-being. Kind of a novel approach. I'll let that sink in, but why bother? Why do we care about employee engagement? Here's some data, and I believe strongly in data. Uh, I kind of have a rule that I live by that says, in God we trust, everybody else brings data. Uh, the Hay Group, Helen Muris and Peggy Schubert of the Hay Group produced a working paper in 2001 titled Engage Employees and Boost Performance which examined if engaged employees outperform non-engaged employees. Their analysis indicated that Fortune Magazine's America's Most Admired Companies achieved an increased stock appreciation of 50% over their peers, which the authors attributed to engaged employees. We jumped ahead. One, let's go back. Okay, a Gallup survey around the same time found organizations with engaged employees outperformed those without engagement by an impressive 202%. Further research from Bain, they surveyed over 300 senior executives from companies all over the world and they ask them to assess, based on their impressions of employee output, the relative productivity of dissatisfied, satisfied, engaged, and inspired employees. The results point to a productive power of an engaged employee and inspired workforce. If satisfied employees are productive at an index level of 100, they found engaged employees produce at a productive index of 144 nearly half again as much. But then comes the real kicker, inspired employees scored 225 on this, on this scare, scale. From a purely quantitative perspective, it would take two and a quarter satisfied employees to generate the same output as one inspired employee. Now, one of OSHA's basic safety program core building blocks, and why we're talking about this today, since the inception and until today's presentation, has been employee involvement. Written in the updated OSHA handbook for small business, revised in, 19, in 2005, the agency clearly advises the owners of small businesses to involve employees in workplace activities.
So if you ask most safety practitioners, how do you involve employees, they respond, safety committee. Large industrial concerns like U.S. Steel, Eastman Kodak, Mid-Valley Steel, to name but a few, were cited by the early 20th century safety movement as leaders in utilizing safety committees to reduce accidents. However, not everybody runs, buys into the classic safety committee structure for engaging employees. Indeed, many of the organizations use the safety committee format as a substitute for authentic and widespread employee involvement in their safety efforts. This was described by Dan Peterson in his book, Safety Management, and later on in an article in Industrial Safety and Health News in March of 2010. Still, the conventional wisdom of the safety movement has overwhelmingly embraced the use of safety committees as a method of employee particip participation in the safety program since the movement's beginning. Keeping with my rule of, in God we trust, let's look at some data. As of yet, there are no federal requirements for safety committees in private sector workplaces, but 21 states require them in various forms. Uh, beginning in the 1980s and 1990s, many states began in earnest revising their workers' compensation laws with the stated goal to reduce occupational injuries and subsequent workers' compensation costs. A major influence to adopt workers' compensation reform at the time was to attract and retain businesses that were abandoning high workers' comp and cost states in favor of more attractive lower workers' compensation cost states. State after state began to promulgate requirements for safety committees via their workers' compensation reform or in state-approved OSHA plans. By the mid-1990s, nine states had adopted reforms that required safety committees, with a few states offering employers a discount on their workers' compensation premiums if they had a safety committee in place. We are going to focus on this mandatory group of nine states that required every private sector employer to have a safety committee. Here's the group of nine and their basic requirements, and I want to note that Florida discontinued this program, reducing the number to eight states in our little review. The top line of the small print data shows the U.S. total case incident rate for all industry by year, with the group of eight states data in the same year's column underneath. As you have no doubt noticed by now, only Minnesota equaled the U.S. rate in 2011, while every other state had an unfavorable, unfavorable comparison every year. I calculated the combined rates of this eight-state group and came up with this data depicted on this slide. A much better graphic, but not so much better were the results. The blue uh, columns are the states, uh, and the red is the U.S. national average, the total case incident rate. In 2010, the states lagged the national average a combined 13%. 2011, it was 16. 2012, remained at 16. 13, it dropped to 23% behind the national average. And in 14, it was 21%. Not exactly stellar numbers. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, I think Mike Belcher previously stated safety excellence not in doing a lot of things. And part of the reason I think mandatory safety committees and participation fail is that it sets a minimum. It establishes its equal representation and uh, the uh, laws limit the committee size. And uh, these states failed to outperform, outperform, even failed to equal the overall performance of the entire country because they set these minimums that many regarded as good enough and thereby excluded a lot of employees. 
Indeed, Dan Peterson seems to have hit the nail on the head on this one. So what can you do? Well, you can build upon these foundational elements, satisfaction, engagement, and inspiration. The fund foundational elements, call them employee satisfaction, are fundamental such as having a safe work environment and the tools necessary to do the job. Abraham Maslow taught us that we can't concern ourselves with higher goals until we have the necessities of life, including security. So it is in the workplace. First things first, build the culture that Mike discussed previously using the applicable tools that Sam's going to bring up shortly. Picture in your mind satisfied employees encountering a roadblock to their goals. Given the tools, they will figure out around a way around. Next come the elements of true engagement, such as the feeling that you're part of an extraordinary team, that you're learning and growing, and that you can make a real impact. Picture in your mind again, engaged employees encountering that roadblock to their goals. They will come at it with ropes, ladders, scaffolds, any tool they have to go up and over it. And then at the top of the foundational element, perhaps the equivalent of Maslow's self-actualization is the feeling that you derive meaning and purpose from the company's mission. That's inspiration. Picture in your minds now inspired employees encountering a roadblock to their goals. They will blast right through it to reach their goals. Living in New England, I must point out a sports example. The New England Patriots in Super Bowl 51, down 28 to three in the third quarter, and they came back. Super Bowl 52 wasn't quite the same result, but nobody on either side of the ball left that game early. The next man up is inspired players. But we don't have to go back to the Super Bowl for inspiration. It happens every day in many places. Fellow Indiana State alum and Oakland A's lefty Sean Manea faced the hottest team in baseball last Saturday and promptly threw the Major League, Base, Major League Baseball's first no-hitter of 2018. Does anyone think he was inspired? So start by creating that safe environment using the tools that are necessary. Make employees feel that they are part of something special. Celebrate their achievements coach and mentor when they succeed, and when they struggle, to provide an ongoing learning environment. When you follow these first two steps, the natural progression is to inspire and fully engaged employees. Thank you for your time this afternoon, and I'll turn it back over to Andy. John, thanks so much. Um, the worker participation piece, clearly um, a key element and an important piece in moving forward. Now, we're about to move into the last section of the presentation, which is about systematic approaches to find and fix hazards. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam Gallardo. Sam, you've got the ball. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Sam Gallardo. I have 39 years experience in managing safety health. My forte over the years has been safety management systems, and some of the tools that I'm gonna talk about today um, are actually embedded in my management-based safety process that I developed uh, when I was working with corporations and for corporations over the years. Mike began today discussing that culture change requires commitment and involvement. But the big question is, how do you do that? How do you generate commitment? How do you generate involvement within an organization? One of the most important things that I have learned over the years is that you do that utilizing very simple tools. We in the safety profession from time to time try to make things really complex and really techni uh, technical. And when we do that, we actually push people away from getting involved and getting committed to the safety cause. So over the years, I've developed these tools that I'm gonna talk about as part of my management-based safety process, 
as part of the organizations that I've worked with, with two things in mind. How do I keep them very, very simple? And how do I assure that they are time sensitive uh, that when people utilize the tools, they're not going to be overwhelmed uh, by some um, extraordinary time commitment? So today we've talked about management leadership, worker participation, and I'm going to close out our discussion today talking about a systematic approach to find and fix workplace hazards. Those are really the three most uh, critical elements to an effective safety health program. Let's just start, though, really at a 30,000-foot level if we could. A systematic find and fix approach includes several things. Number one, analyzing historical incident data. We have to look at the history to tell us what the future may bring. So I think it's very important that we stand back and analyze what has happened in an organization. I believe in the old adage, if it has happened before, it will happen again, and it usually does in most workplaces. Number two, I think it's important at a 30,000-foot level to interview workers. I firmly believe that workers are in the best position to identify hazards, uh, identify the ways that we can address those hazards as well. So without uh, interviewing workers to find out what's on their mind, to uh, gain that insight that they have, I think we'd be missing a very significant way of of uh, dealing with hazards and fixing hazards within the workplace. Number three, performing site-specific inspections uh, goes without saying. You know, probably that's one of the first things that evolved in the, in the safety profession, where people went out and performed inspections, whether they were safety inspectors or safety committees or groups of individuals. Um, that's a mainstay, and we can't get away from uh, uh, the desire to perform inspections as part of an effective safety and health management system as part of the find and fix process. Next is conducting task-specific risk assessments, also very critical. It's not just what uh, lies within the work environment, it's also how people perform that particular task that will get them in trouble. So doing a thorough assessment of that task is very important. And last but not least, again, on a 30,000-foot level, is a methodology to facilitate root cause analysis of previous incidents. In my 39 years of managing safety, I've learned one thing. We get really excited when accidents and injuries do occur. We don't get too excited when we're trying to fix those, though. We should get excited in that uh, phase of the game. The reality is time distances, uh, time gets in the way, distance gets in the way from the incident, and the next thing you know, incidents fall through the cracks. So facilitating an effective root cause analysis process helps us identify hazards, helps us define those hazards as well as to fix those hazards. So that's really at a 30,000-foot level. Now let's really take it down now to a, a on-the-floor level, we'll call it. I um, put my find and fix tools into three categories. I call them employee tools, supervisor tools, and leader tools. Now these are, this is not a comprehensive listing of every one of those tools that I've developed or utilized over the years. But it hits the ones that I think uh, have most promise for most organizations. Uh, and again, these tools are very easy and simple to implement. Let's start talking about the employee tools. First is pre-flight checklist, risk finder, participative inspections, a find and fix process all in itself. And then we're going to also talk about personal safety plan, which is a very powerful employee tool. Let's start by talking about pre-flight safety checklists. My son is a, is a pilot. Uh, the first thing that he does is complete a pre-flight safety checklist before he flies the airplane. Not only does he do a pre-flight safety checklist, but he does a multitude of other checklists. Why does he do that? Well, he does that to make sure that he's able to identify hazards that are in the way of making that flight safe. And then if he identifies hazards, he's going to be able to apply required control measures. So a, a sound pre-flight checklist process at the workplace level does the exact same thing. It helps employees, when they use them daily, to confirm they know the hazards that are associated with that particular task, they understand the risks, and they also understand the required control measures. It helps them refresh on the task safety requirements for that particular task as well, and the checklist can also be used to inspect the work area before they perform that particular work. The second tool I'd like to talk about is something called Risk Finder. I call it Risk Finder but it's really just a situational hazard risk assessment process. Uh, many organizations have developed their own situational hazard risk assessment process. Again, mine is just called Risk Finder. What does Risk Finder do? It helps employees to identify hazards prior to performing a task. 
Now, typically, Risk Finder is used in an organization where there are not pre-flight checklists or where the task is involved in something where there is no pre-flight checklist already developed. So you're going to use the risk finder to go through a systematic analysis of that particular task to identify the hazards that may be present. And then after identifying the hazards that may be present, you're going to use a process where you're going to apply layered control measures before you proceed. So it's a, it's a systematic process to, um, to situationally evaluate exactly what could potentially go wrong and then what you're going to specifically do to prevent that from going wrong. The next employee tool is something called participative inspections and observations. Again, a very powerful tool to get employees involved in the process of identifying hazards, identifying risks, and uh, mitigating those risks all by themselves. They fall into two categories. We're going to call the first category workplace inspections or work area inspections. It's whereby employees are actually inspecting the work area. Now, typically, they're not doing it blindly. They're using some kind of a checklist, some kind of an inspection guide to help them. The second is what's called peer-to-peer -peer observations. Many years ago, the word behavior-based safety caught fire in the, the safety world. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here when we're talking about a participative observation process. It's a peer-to-peer -peer inspection or peer-to-peer -peer observation where one employee observes another employee and vice versa. They're evaluating the hazards, they're evaluating the risks, they're evaluating compliance to assure things are going according to what is expected for that particular task or that particular work area. The next tool that I want to share with you is actually called Find and Fix itself. Now, when I talk about Find and Fix as a tool, I'm talking about a process. It's a process whereby hazards and risks are being identified, and there's some form of recognition that goes along with that. Um, both um, Mike and John talked about the power of engagement and the power of recognition. Well, this goes uh, right to that, uh, to that point. Um, so what is a find and fix process? It's really a simple process. It does not have to be elaborate. It does not have to be uh, complicated. It's a simple process whereby you're challenging employees to continually identify unsafe actions and unsafe conditions in the workplace. Now, most of the find and fix processes that I've seen over the years are very much focused on unsafe conditions. And, and, and that's fine. If they start that way, that's wonderful. If they expand to identifying unsafe actions, that's great, too. But after the employee identifies the unsafe action or the unsafe condition, they're also engaged in the next most important step, and that is recommending protective, protection measures. So the employee is involved in identifying the hazard as well as having uh, the ability to, to uh, participate in how to fix that particular hazard in the workplace. Now, once employees are involved in that process, they should also be recognized and rewarded for their contributions. And again, it's something that should be very simple. It shouldn't be complicated. Some of the best processes that I've seen over the years are something uh, whereby the employee is, uh, there's a picture taken of a hazard uh, prior to it being fixed that was identified by the, by the employee. There was a picture taken after the hazard was fixed there was a picture of the employee receiving some form of minor recognition for that contribution to the safety effort. Uh, very, very powerful tool. Again, don't make it complicated. Make it very easy for the employees to participate and very easy for the safety professionals on staff to administer. administer. The next tool that I want to talk about is something called a personal safety plan, also a very powerful tool for employees. So what's a personal safety plan? A personal safety plan is developed by workers. It's their plan. It's their plan to identify significant on-the-job risks and hazards as well as off-the-job risks and hazards. I know we're talking very much about on-the-job issues as part of this webinar, but, um, but one important uh, point that I would like to make is that most employees are exposed um, very significantly off-the-job as well. So it's not just the, the hazards on the job that have to be identified and fixed. It's also the hazards and risks off the job that should be identified and risked by employees as well. After they identify these hazards and risks, what do they do? Well, once again, they're involved in developing the ways to mitigate those hazards and risks. What can they do personally to mitigate that exposure, to reduce that exposure to harm? That's what a, a personal safety plan is all about. Uh, these are found in organizations that um, excel. Uh, we'll call them world-class organizations. You'll find 
uh, personal safety plans in place at all levels of the organization, from the CEO all the way down uh, uh, through uh, the lowest levels of the organization. Let's now talk about some supervisor tools. We're going to talk about risk finder for supervisors, safety walkdowns, safety huddles, and safety fix meetings. Risk finder for supervisors is very similar to the risk finder for employees. The only difference is it's conducted by supervisors. It's actually led by the supervisors. So the employees are part of the risk finder process with their supervisors. They're part of discussing the hazards and risks that are part of the task that's being assigned. Uh, when a supervisor is assigning a, a non-routine task, they'll gather the employees together to discuss and resolve the hazards before the task is performed. It's also used when there's a new process or task implemented within an organization. There's a multitude of uses for the risk finder process, but these are two of the, the main um, um, ways that risk finder can be used. Imagine for a second when you have a brand new process or a brand new task. You don't know what can occur. So the whole purpose of risk finder is going through a methodical process to identify what can occur, what can potentially occur, can occur, and then what could be done to mitigate those hazards and those risks that are identified by all engaged in that discussion. Again, it's a discussion process that's facilitated by a supervisor involving the employees. Next tool that I'd like to talk about is something called safety walkdowns. And it's nothing more than a supervisor conducting an observation of the work area to assess the work area hazards and to review worker compliance. I always associate a safety walkdown as, uh, as something like a flight attendant does. You know, the captain gives out the order to, uh, you know, stow your, your, uh, your materials before landing, make sure your seat belt is, is on, uh, make sure your, your seat back is up and your tray table is up. But the, the captain can't get up and walk down the aisles to verify exactly what's occurring. He'll send the agent down, and we're going to call the agent the flight attendant, and the agent goes out to verify. They're, ver they're verifying uh, the hazards that may still exist, and they're verifying passenger compliance. Well, that's nothing different than what a safety walk down is. It's the exact same thing. A supervisor goes out and conducts observations of the work area as well as the employees to determine whether, in fact, they're going to be safe in performing their tasks or, in fact, they're, uh, or if, in fact, there are or issues that have to be addressed, the supervisor will address the issue with the employee at that particular time. Safety huddles is another tool that uh, is used in, um, in great organizations. They spend a lot of time using safety huddles, not just to talk to employees, but to talk with employees. So the safety huddle from a find and fix perspective is a brief daily meeting that's facilitated by supervisors engaging employees to discuss hazards and risks. Once again, we're trying to find the hazards, we're trying to fix the hazards, we're trying to fix the problems that may exist and put our workers at harm. These are done continually also to resolve identified issues. So from, from time to time, an employee will bring up a particular hazard or a risk. This safety huddle process is used to discuss what is happening with respect to the resolution of that hazard or risk that is identified and it's done every single day as part of that process. The last tool that I'll talk about from a supervisory perspective is something called safety fix meetings. And of all the tools that I've used over the years, I think this is the absolute most powerful tool that supervisors can, uh, can utilize to find and fix hazards. Typically, the way the process works is supervisors will gather employees in a room and conduct a very short proactive meeting. And the whole purpose of the meeting is to brainstorm solutions to hazards which affect the employees that are invited to the meeting. So at that point in time, the, the hazard has already been identified. What hasn't been identified is how to deal with that particular hazard. So it's a way to get all the employees engaged that are exposed to that particular hazard to brainstorm the solutions to that hazard and then come up with the best fix. And what is so powerful about a safety fix meeting is the fact that the supervisor doesn't weigh in at all. The supervisor doesn't come up with a fix. The supervisor doesn't tell the employees how to fix that particular hazard. It is done democratically, and it's done using every employee in the meeting uh, to, again, brainstorm their solutions and then vote on the best way to address that particular hazard within that particular workplace. I've used it uh, time and time again over the years. It's a very, very powerful find and fix tool. 
I'll conclude this afternoon with talking about some leader tools. Um, leaders also have to be engaged. I just have two leader tools here to discuss with you today, but as part of my own process, my management-based safety process, I believe there are five or six very solid leader tools that facilitate engagement. And again, every one of those tools are revolving around finding and fixing hazards because that's ultimately the goal. That's the entire goal of safety management. How do we find and fix hazards so somebody will not be harmed in the future? So a couple of the leader tools I'm going to talk about are root cause evaluations, and the second, and the second tool is uh, called uh, safety tours. Let's start with root cause evaluations if we could. One of the things that I've learned over the years in managing safety is there's, again, a lot of emphasis uh, within an organization when an incident occurs. Everybody gets excited, everybody gets involved, you know, how are we going to prevent this from reoccurring, how are we going to do this, how are we going to do that? And then, and then again, distance sets in, time sets in, budget set in, things get in the way, and the next thing you know, all those good ideas find their way uh, to fall through the cracks somehow. I've seen it time and time again, even in the organizations where I manage safety um, personally. So why do we want leaders involved in root cause evaluations? We want them involved in root cause evaluations because they can prevent those important things from falling through the cracks. How do they do that? Well, number one, they're going to be in the position of verifying the causal factors and precursors have been properly identified. And by the way, that's also a pretty significant, a pretty significant problem within organizations with, with respect to investigations. Sometimes all the causal factors and precursors are not properly identified. So leaders are deeply engaged in making sure that all the causal factors and precursors have been identified. Second, they're in the next and most important phase of the root cause evaluation process, and that is to be absolutely sure that what action has been initiated, that it will permanently prevent a reoccurrence of that event. And again, that is so critical, and that falls apart in so many organizations. I don't know um, if this statistic is, is valid or not, but I've heard it mentioned uh, time and time again that, uh, that Air France had uh, many opportunities to prevent the Concorde from blowing up on takeoff, as it did in its final flight. Um, there were 50 or so near misses that occurred, I have been told over the years, that um, that they could have identified those causal factors and precursors that led to that fateful event at the end of, uh, at the, end of the road with, re with respect to uh, when that plane crashed. Had there been an effective um, root cause evaluation process at Air France, perhaps that would have not occurred. They could have identified those causal factors, they could have identified those precursors, and they could have taken the steps to make sure that it would never happen again. That obviously did not happen or did not happen successfully within an organization. Um, no discredit to Air France, I think they're a good organization, but there was a flaw in that process at that point in time. So root cause evaluations is a great way to engage leaders in a find and fix process. A second great way to engage leaders is something called safety tours. And what's a safety tour? Well, it probably isn't what you think. Um, a lot of leaders and CEOs and presidents and, and um, high-level folks in organizations over the years when I was teaching this concept, you know, they wanted to go out and identify hazardous conditions and unsafe workplace actions. And I kind of had to pull back on the reins when I was teaching them, teaching them this, this concept. You know, I said, it's great that you can identify hazardous conditions and unsafe actions as part of conducting a safety tour. And I want you to do that. However, that's not your purpose as a leader. Your purpose as a leader is to evaluate the success of your safety effort. If you're seeing hazardous conditions and you're seeing unsafe actions, it's telling you your safety management system is failing. And that's where you have to focus your efforts on finding and fixing exactly why your safety management system is failing, not on the actual unsafe condition or unsafe action that existed within the workplace. So when I turned them around in that process and they had a clear understanding of what their role was, uh, they did exceptionally well. And again, that's a very, very important tool of engaging leaders in finding and fixing hazards within an organization. Um, again, it all comes down to finding and fixing hazards. You know, we take a look at safety management. Uh, it all comes down to that. And if we spend ample time engaging um, leaders within organizations, engaging employees within organizations, and engaging supervisors within an organization, 
I think we'll do what's expected with respect to creating a great safety culture uh, within, that, uh, within that entity. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sam. All right. Um, one of the things that we very much want is not for you to just listen to this webinar, um, but to actually use this information and get your business, get your workplace to take a step in the right direction. And so with that in mind, a couple of things for people um, to begin thinking about. You can sign up for the Safe and Found campaign communication. Uh, you will get either at OSHAquickcakes.gov or through our Safe and Found listserv information that you can use, including um, new tools and resources as they become available, information about our monthly webinars, and other messaging and information. So please start by signing up for either Quick Takes or our Safe and Found listserv or both. The second thing is in the middle of August this year, we will have our sec second Safe and Found Week. This is an opportunity for your workplace to show its commitment to safety and health. For businesses that already have a safety and health program, this is a great way to celebrate what you're already doing. For businesses that are just getting started, this is a wonderful opportunity to dip your toe into the pool and kind of try safety and health programs before you buy. We have easy, medium, and advanced activities for each of these three core elements that workplaces can, um, can begin doing. Sam um, is a great representative of our Pennsylvania consultation program. We have free on-site consultation programs in every state and territory in the U.S. Small and medium-sized businesses can call and get an on-site consultant to come to their business to help them work on specific safety and health programs, sorry, specific safety and health hazards, or their safety and health program in general. These consultation visits are not in any way connected to enforcement activities. They are done completely separately, and most of our on-site consultation folks are actually um, state uh, university employees and not OSHA employees at all. We also have in every state and territory education centers where you can sign up for training classes, again, on specific hazards and specific topics and specific programs, as well as safety and health programs in general. Those are great resources for you, and we encourage you to go to our education centers um, and take a class. The other, the, the last thing is that we have partnerships with organizations all around the country through the American Society of Safety Engineers, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, the National Safety Council, the Voluntary Protection Program, uh, Participant Program Association. All of these organizations have state or local chapters throughout the country where you can find people who are actually doing things in your community around safety and health. These are folks who can serve as resources. These are folks who can serve as mentors. These are places that you can go for information, and we encourage you to reach out to the state and local chapters of all of these organizations and get connected, get involved in safety and health programs. Now, as we move into the question and answer part of this, um, let me note that the, the recording for this webinar and the slides will be available shortly at OSHA.gov forward slash safe and sound week. You can also um, send questions that you have to the Safe and Sound campaign email address that you have on your screen. And then we're going, uh, and now we'll begin um, going into Q&A. Before I give some questions that have come in over the chat line, let me open it up to um, our moderator, Shirley, and Shirley, if you could give folks instructions on how they can send questions to you over the phone line. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one. You will be prompted to record your name. To withdraw your question, you may press star followed by two. Again, just press star followed by one to ask a question. And one moment, please, for our first question. Okay, while Shirley is uh, gathering questions, on the chat line, um, Sam, we had a number of folks send in uh, questions about, is there a specific risk assessment tool that you recommend, or do you have templates 
of some of the tools that you talked about available? Um, there, there are templates available. I, I do have templates, Andrew, uh, that I've used over the years myself. I think um, what I have learned over the years is every organization is different. Um, every organization will build their own process using their own uh, platform in a sense. But uh, I'm sure that we can share some templates of uh, what a uh, typical risk assessment process would look like. All right, great. So uh, when Sam sends those, we will include those in some of the materials uh, that we have on Safe and Sound uh, webpage. One of the other questions that came in over the chat line um, was a question about, do any of you have recommendations for leading indicators for leadership or employee engagement? How do you know, um, what can you track and measure to make sure that leadership and employee engagement is happening in your safety and health program? I can, I can take another shot at that one as well, Andrew. This is Sam. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is the, the tools that I just shared with the group are easily trackable. And again, don't, be, um, don't make it complex. Just track it beginning utilizing a spreadsheet process in terms of who's doing what at the required frequency uh, and then publicize that. It's amazing what something that simple will do once you start identifying what tools are expected to be uh, utilized within your organization, tracking them, and then publicizing that, it will catch on like wildfire within the organization. So that is one uh, methodology that I would share. Great. Thanks, Dan. Mike or John, do you have any thoughts on leading indicators for leadership or employee engagement? Well, well, this is Mike. Uh, I've used perception surveys in the past, and without naming names, uh, there are a number of those surveys that are available through different organizations. I find that to be a very effective tool and uh, as, a lead, as a leading indicator in really understanding the safety climate in an organization. I've also done things uh, as simple as requiring uh, facilities to turn in monthly reports. Uh, in fact, one report uh, we use in our organization uh, requires our production managers to turn in, uh, shows the level of activities with regards to inspections, safety meetings, and conducting observations. Uh, so we require uh, all our plants to provide that, and we find that to be a, a very good uh, leading indicator. Uh, for our organization. Excellent. I've so, got to, uh, this is John, and I've got to echo uh, Mike's uh, perception surveys. I think, you know, oftentimes management thinks one thing's going on and employees have a whole different concept. And until you ferret those things out and, and see how different they are, or are they aligned? Uh, you don't really know what areas to concentrate on. Let me just add one other thing if I could. This is Sam. Um, Mike talked about monthly report outs uh, within his organization. A lot of organizations are starting to go to a real-time process, and I think real-time can be very, very powerful with respect to um, the measurement and execution uh, and monitoring of uh, leading indicators. And again, I use a lot of aviation concepts um, in, my, in my processes that I've built over the years, and I always equate the measurement of leading indicators to, you know, the cockpit gauges that my son is looking at when he's flying an airplane. You know, let's, let's just think if he was only looking at those gauges every once in a while, what would happen to the airplane? The airplane would crash. Well, the, the whole purpose of measure, measuring and monitoring performance is to have real-time data. So the better you are at providing real-time data to leaders within an organization, the better you're going to be in terms of enhancing um, your capabilities from a safety management uh, perspective and a safety, safety culture enhancement perspective. You know, making sure that they have access to real-time data is very important. I also equate it to the fact that I can guarantee that in most organizations, they have real-time data with respect to production output or quality output or some of the other parameters that are being measured in the organization. But sometimes in safety, we only give them that data, you know, monthly or quarterly, and that's, um, that's something that we can do a much better job on, making sure our data is real time as well. Wonderful. All right, so we've got um, a couple more questions. Um, before we move on to other questions, let me um, just do a plug. Mike mentioned employee perception surveys. It turns out that next month, 
The National Safety Council, one of our other co-organizers, is going to be doing a free webinar on the use of employee perception surveys in your safety and health program. So um, keep an eye out, folks, who are on quick takes or are on our listserv. You will be getting information about that webinar um, very shortly. Shirley, before we go to some other questions on the chat line, is there anything on the phone lines? There is. We do have a question. And if you'd like to ask a question, just press star followed by one. Our first question comes from Corey Crompton. Your line is open. Go ahead with your question. Hi, I have two questions. The first a speaker said that an if an organization requires a process to be completed 100% of the time, it will fail. Could you expand on that statement? Could, could you say that again, please? Yes. Uh, there was a statement made that said, if an organization requires a safety process to be completed 100% of the time, it will more likely fail. Could you expand on that oh. statement? Got you. I, okay, I, I, if I said that, I apologize. Uh, okay. what, what I meant to say was that if you, if a, organization relies on workers doing the right thing every time, uh, it will fail. So there are going to be situations um, that occur in which people make mistakes or they have a mental lapse or, or so forth. Um, so errors are occurring every day. Um, we all make errors. Your best people uh, in your organization are doing that each and every day. So we can't just rely on workers doing the right thing. We have to understand that people are going to make mistakes and we have to have a system that's error tolerant um, that's going to prevent operational upsets from occurring despite knowing that people are going to make mistakes. So I'll kind of piggyback on, on something that Sam talked about. Uh, a good example of that would be the use of a checklist. And so as a person who has a pilot's license and who's talked to a lot of pilots, I know, and, and you know occasionally, one of the, the things you have to do when you land an airplane, a complex airplane, is put the landing gear down. Well, there's been a number of incidents where some of the most experienced pilots have forgotten to do that. And one of the reasons we don't see as many of those incidents occurring now is because we have what's called consequence controls, alarm systems, uh, checklists, and things that have been put into place to prevent that. And that's one of the reasons that aviation is so safe these days, uh, is because of the use of what we call consequence controls. If we simply just told our pilots to be safe and had to rely on pilots doing the right thing every time, we'd have a lot more aviation accidents. So, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, very good. That clarifies it very well. Okay, so um, thank you. So we had a couple of questions come in over the chat line um, asking the speakers, do you have recommendations on um, delivering the message of the importance of safety to upper management? How do you convince upper management that safety and health is a very important topic and get them engaged? Let me take a shot at it if I could. Um, I, this is going to be a, a bold uh, tool for you to utilize. Um, I call it the black piece of paper test. And um, one of the things that, um, well, let me just give you a little history on the black piece of paper test. I was called in to uh, help an organization many years ago facilitate a significant safety culture change. And the leader of the organization uh, called me into his office and he said, uh, Sam, my, my safety program just stinks and, you know, my safety culture stinks and I just can't figure it out. And uh, his name was John. And I said, John, let me help you figure that out. I'd like you to get your calendar off of your desk and I'm going to, um, I want to talk to you about some things. So he got his calendar off his desk and brought it over to a little conference room table and I gave him a blank piece of paper. And I said, John, I would like you to go back one month with respect to what you've done in this organization to impact your safety culture personally over the last month. I'd like you to take this blank piece of paper and write down every activity that you've been personally engaged in over the last month. Within about three seconds, he gave me the blank piece of paper back and said, I get it, I understand. I understand what you're trying to tell me. The reality is I have done nothing. And that's, uh, that's the reality of most organizations. So when you can have that, that sit down with them, 
and explain to them that their actions are very, very critical in driving commitment and involvement throughout the organization, their personal actions, I think they will take the hint very, very quickly as that senior leader did in that organization. From that day forward, he became a poster child for safety for that organization, and everybody was trying to follow his lead from that point forward. Great. All right. Shirley, do we have any other questions on the phone line? At this time, I'm showing no further questions. And again, just press star one to ask a question. Okay. So one of the other questions that came in on the chat line um, is folks were asking, do you have a recommended frequency for lower risk businesses to perform risk assessments or hazard assessments? How often should low risk businesses be looking at their risk assessments? And again, I open that up to any of the speakers. Well, I'll take another shot at it since I talked about the risk assessment process, I guess, Mike. Um, I think the frequency should not be necessarily dependent on whether you're a low risk or high risk businesses, a business. Um, over the years, I have been uh, part and parcel to, to many cases um, that you would have thought would have not occurred in a low risk business. There were fatalities that occurred in a low risk business where um, the activity was, was you know, seemingly non-consequential. And um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't look at the, the, the risk of the business to make a determination on whether, in fact, uh, you should increase or decrease the, the frequency on risk assessments. I really think you have to look at the exposure, uh, what people are exposed to every day. Um, I just go back to, to many years ago, I worked with an organization and, um, you know, one of, the, one of the focus areas of that organization was on the heavy lifting side of the business, we'll call it, you know, where the real work was done. Well, we went back and, and made a second pass at that organization to further impact the safety culture, and we were astounded to realize that about 30% of their incidents were occurring in the office environment. People slipping and tripping on, on stairs and, uh, you know, walking in aisles, and, and you couldn't believe the number of injuries that they've had, that they had in those, what I would believe are low risk, low risk organizations, or, or low risk departments, we'll call them. So don't, um, don't look at it from, you know, the perspective of high risk, low risk. Uh, look at it from a task perspective. You know, can something happen in this task that cause somebody to, to be harmed, and if the answer to that is yes, I think you ought to be performing a risk assessment as part of that process. And, and this is John. I think, you know, to build on that a little bit too, you need to keep safety in front of people all the time. It's, it's not something that, you know, you do once a year, once a quarter, or whatever. It's a constant ongoing thing that you're continuously improving on. Great, thanks so much. Um, all right, we're out of time. Some folks have asked about future webinars. Um, so let me give you a preview of what's coming. In May, as I mentioned, the National Safety Council will be doing um, something on the use of employee perception surveys. I should also mention that the Center to Protect Workers' Rights has a safety climate assessment tool that you can also use. Um, that was done in one of our pri uh, previous webinars. In May, we will also have a free webinar that's a pre-recorded one from the American Industrial Hygiene Association that is on selling safety to frontline workers. And in June, we're going to have a live webinar on Safe and Sound Week and how people can participate and what it looks like. We'll have some people who have done it uh, in last year's Safe and Sound, and we'll talk about uh, how to help your business show its commitment to safety and health this year uh, in August. With that, let me thank, again, all of the speakers for a great job on their presentations and on the questions and answers, a recording for this webinar and the slides um, and templates for materials will be available at osha.gov forward slash safe and sound. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention today. Have a good day.